it's quite an honor to be asked to give a number theory seminar. I, as I meant to imply in my abstract, I'm not really at all a number theorist. Um, and in fact, the result I mentioned in the abstract is the, the only result I've actually published in number theory that can be, in the sense that it can be mentioned, it can be described without um, using any logic. I'm really a mathematical logician, a model theorist uh, by training. Um, so that paper, as I said, was published in the Journal of Symbolic Logic, and the reason for that is that the main theorem there was this theorem I, I've written here. So if you take any subset of the real plane, which is definable in no minimal structure, now I'm sure many of you won't know necessarily what that is, but you don't need to for the rest of the talk, but I'm just mentioning this as a piece of history. Um, so if that's a, a subset of the real plane with empty algebraic part, now the algebraic part of the set is just the union of all the connected algebraic curves defined over Q, the rationals that are contained in X. So if there are no such curves, um, then it's the case that if we just look at the integer points on the curve uh, on X, which is essentially a union, a finite union of curves, um, then the number of integer points of height h uh, is bounded by h to the epsilon for every epsilon with a constant there that depends on epsilon. Now, if you do know about O minimal structures, you will know that we know much more than this now. Um, but I couldn't prove any more until I met a year or two later, Jonathan Peeler. And then we proved this same result uh, for any definable subsets of R to the N and not just for integer points, for rational points. So, um, uh, as I say, it wasn't until I met Jonathan who proved similar results for rational points uh, for analytic sets. And then we sort of combined things and got the full result that we wanted in 2006, I think that was published. Now, but I'm not going to talk about that. I'm going to talk about the other result that was in this paper that I just noticed as an afterthought almost, is that if your O minimal structure is Rn, and you don't need really to know what that is, it's just if X is a what's called a globally sub-analytic subset of R squared, and I'll define that in a second, um, but it's a purely analytic notion, then in fact, the h to the epsilon can be brought right down to C log log h. So much, much smaller. The number of pairs, integer pairs of points lying in a globally subanalytic set with empty algebraic part is bounded by C log log h. So just to quickly recap, if necessary, what subanalytic sets are. Um, well, first of all, for a bounded subset of R to the N, it's called semi-analytic. If around every point, it can be described by equalities at, how do I get, oop, what have I done here? Uh, sorry. I think what I've done here. Can you see? Oh, there we are. Okay. Um, so it's semi analytic. If around every point, so this is for a subset of R to the N, if around every point in R to the N, um, it can be described by equalities and inequalities between real analytic functions. So if around every point in R to the N, not just in S, but in R to the N, there's a neighborhood of that point such that S intersect the neighborhood is a Boolean, finite Boolean combination of sets of this form. Those X's such that FIX is zero and GJX is greater than zero, where the FIs and GJs are real analytic functions on this neighborhood. And sub-analytic is the same, except the FIs and GJs now are allowed to be composed with inverse functions. So they're allowed to be composed with y minus a divided by x minus a, um, provided y minus a is strictly less than x minus a. 
Uh, actually, that's not the usual definition, but it's equivalent by a theorem of Deneff and Vandendries. Um, so, well, just to, if you haven't met this before, before just to get a feeling uh, of the difference between these two types of sets, and there's a big difference, there's this example of Osgood from 1910. Osgood, I think, was a, an American mathematician from the 19th and early 20th century who, who did work on um, when a uh, single variable differential, dif well, if you have a function of many variables in certain situations, when um, differentiability with respect to each variable separately implies full differentiability. I think that's one of his, uh, one of his theorems. But anyway, he came up with this example. Um, suppose you take the triples of real numbers satisfying these conditions. So naught less than or equal to y, less than or equal to x, and um, z minus e to the y over x is zero. So the graph of the function e to the y over x. Now that's a two, obviously in some sense, a two dimensional subset of zero, three cubed, um, which is sub-analytic by definition, uh, but it's not semi-analytic on any neighborhood of the origin. There's, there's no analytic function of three variables which vanishes precisely on this set. Um, so, and the e, the exponential function there is, that can be any transcendental function um, in the example will work. Okay, that's semi and sub-analytic sets. Uh, the global, and that, I just define that for bounded sets, but we're, we're interested in integer points on these sets. So obviously we need our sets to be unbounded for a non-trivial result. So we simply say that it's globally semi-analytic or sub-analytic um, if the above definition applies to the image of the set under your favorite um, semi-algebraic bijection between r to the n and zero, one to the n. So you just take any semi-algebraic bijection with inverse semi-algebraic and that um, and ask for that set, the image, which is now bounded to be semi-algebraic, semi-analytic or sub-analytic. Um, and uh, that's the definition of globally semi-analytic or sub-analytic. Um, now, it's the reason I've mentioned this is that there's a proposition. So this theory was first developed by Voyasevich um, who proved that if you're just in the plane, then globally sub-analytic and globally semi-analytic are actually the same. Uh, and that's used in the proof of, of, the, of this theorem here. This is why the proof works um, in that you only have to deal with semi-analytic sets. Um, in fact, that theorem now just more or less amounts to the following, uh, which I'll call theorem one. Um, if you take any analytic function defined on the neighborhood of the origin, in R squared, real analytic function, real valued real analytic function, whose zero set, uh, the algebraic part of the zero set is empty. So there's no infinite semi-algebraic curves in the zero set. And if H is a sufficiently large natural number, then by this inversion, this row function, you can take that to be almost anything. Um, so here, if we just take it to be the inverse function, then the set of integer pairs, such that their inverses lie in the domain of the function f, and the modulus of a and b are less than or equal to h, and if they happen to be zeros of this function f, then the number of such pairs is less than C log log H. Okay, so that, that's really all the theorem I mentioned before amounts to on because, um, in fact, it's not quite as easy as that. The F you have to take, um, where you, you have to look at its zero set and that's described, can be described by, as a graph of a, a Puiseur series, not necessarily an analytic, function, but 
uh, that's a fairly small detail. And uh, so the essence of the theorem amounts to this. Now, the theorem is definitely false if you just take arbitrary rationals here. Uh, that lie in you as an example of, um, uh, oh, yeah, well, there's certainly examples of um, an analytic function of one variable that takes a lot of rational values for rational arguments, maybe h, even h to the epsilon for epsilon going to zero. Um, so the the first result I mentioned is the best you can do here for rationals, arbitrary rationals. But for inverse integers, um, you get this log log h. Um, and presumably this is also false if you take arbitrary sub-analytic sets in higher dimensions, because you can simply split up rational num a, a pair of rational numbers as a four tuple of integers. Uh, have to be a bit careful about the algebraic part. But um, so this is where the matter rested for, um, nearly 20 years, 18 years or so, I just uh, couldn't improve this or find a decent generalization to other sub-analytic sets. Um, and okay, so, but recently in discussion at a meeting with Galbin Yamini and Gareth Jones, um, we reopened the case and we decided that rather than just dealing with arbitrary sub-analytic sets, or perhaps even arbitrary semi-analytic sets, perhaps it's this theorem I've marked with a star here is the one that you should try and generalize, not be too ambitious and just take an N variable analytic function neighborhood of the origin and uh, just ask about the inverse integer points. Um, I have to say we have no real applications of this result uh, yet, but um, Anyway, we thought we'd just try and prove a generalization of this to n variables and just ask for inverse integer points close to the origin of zeros of analytic functions. Is there a natural bound on how many of those there can be? Now, um, so, well, first of all, a word about the proof of this. The proof of this uses auxiliary polynomials, as in usual transcendence proofs, um, where you convert information about a function uh, taking a large number of, say, a function taking a large number of rational values for rational arguments uh, into another function um, that has a large number of zeros at those points. Um, and then you can that polynomial you construct a polynomial involving the functions, and this is called an auxiliary polynomial. Um, but then Galvin Yamini observed that if you use the other way of constructing it, auxiliary polynomials, which is to make uh, an, another function you construct vanish to high degree at the origin, say, at, um, uh, using the information you have. So he used the different auxiliary polynomial method um, and observed that the following thing, that if in theorem one, uh, if in this theorem, um, you restrict your function f, if you restrict its Taylor coefficients at the origin to lie in some fixed number field, rather than just be arbitrary real numbers, then you can actually reduce this c log log h to just c to a constant. So he observed the following. Um, now this is one of those theorems, once you dare to write it down, it's actually not very difficult to prove. Um, so if in theorem one, the Taylor coefficients of f at the origin lie in a fixed number field, and again, the, um, this is still in two variables, and still the a zero set of F still has zero algebraic, empty algebraic part, um, then there's only a constant number of inter inverse integers that can be zeros of F. So for instance, I'm sure you look at that function. Uh, uh, 
that function has rational Taylor. I mean, the Taylor coefficients of that are all rational. Uh, and so there's only finitely many inverse integers that are zeros of that function. I'm sure you always wanted to know that, but um, anyway, as I say, um, or you get lots of trigonometric functions, logarithmic functions that you can make. But I, as I say, we don't actually have a, a concrete transcendence theorem that follows from this. Yeah, although uh, we do have this constant. Um, anyway, um, so we decided to start using this new method of constructing, well, not new, but new to us, uh, auxiliary polynomials around the origin to um, uh, see what we could do. And indeed, we got the result we wanted. So going back to a function, a real analytic function, defined on the neighborhood of the origin with whose zero set has empty algebraic part, then for all sufficiently large h, we have the following result. If you just take the n tuples of integers of height less than or equal to h, so that's just the maximum modulus of the co coordinates of a, whose inverse, so that's just the tuple consisting of the inverse of the coordinates, okay? Such that the inverse integers of coordinates are a zero of f, that set of points, has cardinality less than the constant, depending on the function, time, that's meant to be times, um, times there, log log h to the n. Okay. And uh, we actually suspect you can do with n over two here, um, the integer part of n over two, but that's not completely worked out. But um, anyway, so that's the, new theorem I wanted to announce. Um, so I mentioned, well, not this generalization, but the original log-log theorem um, to David Masser. I was, he invited me to Basel. And uh, it was around the time he, it hadn't quite come out yet, I think, his book on auxiliary polynomials. And I told him, I said, well, I have a result using auxiliary polynomials. Um, uh, but it's published in the Journal of Symbolic Logic. You might not have seen it. He said, oh, yes, I've seen it. He did. He'd seen it. And he said, it's in my book. I said, oh, oh, well, that's great. Uh, not being a number theorist, I'm quite flattered by this. And he said, yes, it's, uh, it's I call it your log-log theorem. I said, so not only do I have a theorem in David's book, I have something called the log-log theorem, which is, gives me even more status, I, I thought, as a number theorist. And then he looked and he said, yes. He said, yes, your theorem's in my book. It's in the exercises. And so um, I thought, oh, oh. And then he saw I was a bit disappointed. So he said, but it does have an asterisk. So, and if you look at some of the theorems that are in the um, exercises of David's book, you'll see I was probably in quite good company and shouldn't have been too disappointed by that anyway. So, um, I assume David's there somewhere, but anyway, I don't know if he saw that story like that, but uh, anyway. Thanks. Thanks for the plug. Okay. <laughs> no need to put your hand up for that. Yeah. Okay. Um, right. So, so that's the theorem I call theorem 1n. And we also have an algebra uh, number field version, which I call theorem 2n. Uh, so this is the same hypothesis. So we have a function defined in the neighborhood of the origin in real n space, uh, whose zero set has empty algebraic part. And we assume further that the Taylor coefficients of f around zero lie in a fixed number field. Now, there's also something observed by Gal, Gal Binyamini in his proof is that you, you don't need any assumption about the heights of these Taylor coefficients or even their modulus. Well, except, I mean, there's a natural bound coming from convergence, but um, there's, there's no need to have any extra bound on the height as elements of the number field or on the modulus. Um, okay, given that, 
what you can show is that um, if you just look at inverse integer points, which are zeros of f, and providing the coordinates don't differ too much, they're multiplicatively com comparable. Okay, so, so the maximum of the coordinates, of the modulus of the coordinates, is at most the minimum of the coordinates to the power r. So if you take any, say, fixed large r, then the number of such a is bounded by a constant, where the constant has to depend on r. Okay, so it obviously depends on the function and on r. So we have the many variable version of the um, theorem about analytic functions with, with, ta with Taylor coefficients in the number field. So that's true in n variables, providing you restrict um, the coordinates to not uh, drift too far apart as the, as the points go to infinity. Or, well, they can't go to infinity if they don't drift far apart. Um, I should say that in, when n is two, uh, the version I proved above or mentioned above, that naturally holds. That is a thing called a Voiceovich inequality. That in, if n is two, this is forced. Well, for elements in the zero set, they can't drift too far apart. Even the, even the real numbers, the real zeros, can't drift too far apart. Okay, so. Uh, so we actually get a finiteness theorem here, and it turns out that there's a better theorem than theorem 1n, namely the zeros here. So we have the inverse, in the integer points are fairly uniformly distributed, uh, consistent with this upper bound. So. Um, we actually get a, a finiteness theorem. So I call this theorem 1n plus here um, because it's a, it's a stronger theorem, um, but it, it's a finiteness theorem. There's no log logs or no estimates or anything in this theorem. Uh, so it's the same hypothesis about f. Uh, and then we have the following for all r, there is a constant just depending on R, such that for all sufficiently large natural numbers, H1 up to Hn, if you just look at the integer coordinate, the integers whose inverses are zeros of the function and which lie in a box like this. So, well, let's just take R in, equals two. So the jth coordinate, integer coordinate, lies between hj squared and hj to the half. Okay, so suppose we just look at boxes like this, then the number of such points is bounded by a constant. And if you do take r equals two, that clearly implies the log-log theorem, because you can cover um, the points in Z to the N or points in R to the N even uh, of modulus less than or equal to H by about log log H um, to the N square um, cubes like this, cubes of size. Um, um, well, a mul with multiplicatively dependent sides because um well if you just take n equals one you you a squared h squared h to the half then you go down to h to the quarter h to the eighth and of course you just get log log um intervals and so and you just raise that to the power n and you can cover all of um r to the n uh points in r to the n of modulus less than or equal to r by just log log n cubes like this. So you get the log log result, but this is better because it says they are sort of more or less evenly distributed as, as well. Uh, oh, by the way, this is, uh, I should say, this is best possible or the even for n equals two. Um, well, when you formulate it like this, this is best possible. 
um, you can easily construct uh, analytic functions of two variables in the neighborhood of the origin, um, where each such uh, square with r equals two, say, does contain a point that's a zero of f. So the log log h is the best possible um, result. Uh, okay, so for the rest of the talk, I'm just going to try and sketch the proof. And I'll do the number field case because it's a bit easier. Um, and I'm going to do it in a slightly obscure way. And being a model theorist, I'm going to do it model theoretically, I thought. Although um, for the number field case, you don't actually gain a lot doing it this way. But what I want to point out is that um, it's much easier to, we're just going to prove this a finiteness theorem and not one with a subtle log log h bound where we have to do lots of estimates. Um, and so if you want to prove something's finite, um, well, you can do it qualitatively. I'm not going to try and do anything effectively uh, here. I'm just going to prove that you get a contradiction from assuming something's infinite here. So in other words, suppose we have a number field like that, and we have a function, I uh, call it ONK, they're just the power series or the convergent power series whose Taylor series have points in K, and non, not identically zero, and for non-triviality, F of zero is zero. And suppose, I'm not assuming the condition about the algebraic part for this, okay? That will come out in the, in the wash. Um, okay, now suppose we have a sequence of integers, of integer n-tuples, um, a1j up to anj, and suppose that there's some function h of j mapping natural numbers natural numbers to natural numbers, which tends to infinity, as j tends to infinity, such that each of these coordinates lies between h of j and h of j to the r. So, it's, I mean, you could take the minimum of the modulus of the aij's. Okay, so suppose we have this fixed function going to infinity, such that all these coordinates lie in the kind of a multiplicative class of the function h. Okay, and suppose further that um, suppose further that all the the inverses of these integers are zeros of f. Okay, now in general that can happen, but we want to show that it can't. It can only happen if f has a non-trivial algebraic part. Uh, oh, now it's quite important when we go if. Well, I won't have time, but to go on to the where f just has arbitrary real or complex coefficients, uh, that we prove something stronger. So we need to prove something stronger to be able to do a good induction on n. We need to weaken this zero here, um, weaken the assumption to it just being O of h to the minus hj, where a, little h is a function going to infinity as j goes to infinity, any function going to infinity as j goes to infinity. We want to show, no matter how slowly, we want to show that if f at these points has this order of magnitude, doesn't have to be zero, then we can deduce uh, something we want, which I'll state in a minute. Um, so this is a bit like generalizing the original point counting theorem of myself and Jonathan Peeler, um, generalizing it in the way that Philip, Philip Habiger did to approximate point counting. This is roughly the order of magnitude that he shows the point counting theorem holds for. You don't need your points, we're well, just dealing with arbitrary rational points, but you don't need them actually to be on the zero set, uh, but they can be this close to it and you still get your required contradiction. And what is the thing I'm going to be proving? And this will take the rest of the talk. I shall prove 
So there's no assumption here on the algebraic part of the zero set. I shall prove that just under these hypotheses, the functions a1 to the minus one, an to the minus one, there's functions from natural numbers to rationals are algebraically dependent over Q. Um, so in other words, there is a polynomial with rational coefficients such that these functions are a zero of that polynomial for all J. So A1 minus what to the minus one of J up to AN to the minus one of J. Um, for all J satisfy this polynomial. Okay, so the, the functions themselves are algebraically dependent. And that's just on these hypotheses that say they're zeros or that this is very small. And that's more or less all you have to do to prove theorem 2n, because you do an induction on n and you just reduce your set f, where you have to do it with, I guess, with algebraic sets, not just one function, but you just add the polynomial to your system and it reduces the dimension and it, it can't keep reducing the dimension um, unless you go right down to zero and then you'll get a non-trivial algebraic part of your original set. That's just like in the ordinary point counting theorem. Um, so that proof, part of the proof is um, well understood. So the crucial point is to show that if functions like this, inverse integer valued functions going to zero, tending to zero, if they are analytically dependent in this sense, uh, then they're algebraically dependent. Okay, and of course you have to use some transcendence theory. You have to use the fact these are inverse integers. It's obviously not true for arbitrary red sequences of reals. Okay, so the proof of this, which I, let's see, what are we doing? Oh yeah, I should be able to do this in time. I'm going to do a fairly obscure proof. Now, it's not too hard in this for this particular case, the algebraic number field case, um, to do it directly using estimates and taking subsequences and do as various things. But I'm actually going to do a bit of model theory here just because it's what I do, I suppose. Um, OK, so I'm going to suppose there's no such algebraic dependence, okay? And so for each polynomial in the variable Z1 up to Zn, I let Z of P be those J such that this tuple, A1J to the minus one up to Anj to the minus one is a zero of the polynomial. So there might be no such J or there certainly, certainly can't be all such J because I'm supposing these are independent. Okay. Um, is that clear? That's uh, just those J for which this tuple is a zero of P. And then I let I be just those, all those subsets of natural numbers, which are subsets of some ZP. Okay, so it's the X in N such that for some P, not identically zero, X is a subset of ZP. So I'm just closing the set of ZPs uh, undertaking subsets. Then in terms of Boolean algebra, Boolean algebra nomenclature, I is what's called a non-principal ideal of sets. So in other words, it satisfies these four axioms here. Um, firstly, if Y is a member of I and X is a subset of Y, then X is a member of I. That's, that's by construction, that's obvious. Um, I contains every finite set because any finite um, set of inverse integers can be made for zero of some polynomial, obviously with rational coefficients. Now, crucially, if X and Y are in I, then so is their union because if X is a subset of ZP and Y is a subset of ZQ, then X union Y is a subset of ZP times Q, okay? And if we assume this lemma is false, that there's no algebraic dependence, 
then the natural, the set of all natural numbers cannot be a member of I, right? Because that would give us the dependence we are looking for. Um, this part here is the non-principal part of the definition. It contains no, it contains every finite set. Okay, so now we just take a maximal extension of I with these properties. So let I tilde be a maximal using Zorn's lemma, I'm afraid, and that's crucial. You can't do this without some form of the axiom of choice, which might be distasteful to some, but I'll remark on that in a minute. Um, so let I tilde be maximal such that I is contained in I tilde. So we just extend it to a maximal collection of sets satisfying one to four. And then it's a, tiny, a very easy exercise to show that every set is either in it or its complement is. Okay, that's, that's really just an exercise. And these sets that are in it, I'll be calling small, and the sets that are not in it, I'll be calling large. Okay. Now, if you go and look at the model theory literature, um, the set the set of large sets here is sometimes called an ultra filter on N. That's the if you want to look this stuff up. Um, and this is called the maximal ideal of sets. Now we're interested in properties of sequences. And the trick here is to regard a sequence as an element of another field, the sequence itself, and then just do some standard field theory, ring theory uh, in this new field, um, regarding the sequences as just elements rather than sequences. I mean, this, is, this only works if you're just trying to prove a non-finiteness theorem or a finiteness theorem. You, you won't get estimates like this, at least not naively. And so what we do to construct this field is going to be an extension of the, a big algebraic extension, a big algebraically closed extension of the complex numbers. Um, we first do this, uh, suppose f and g are any functions with domain the natural numbers. I don't care what that range is. Uh, we say f is equivalent to g, if you like, here. If the j, such that fj equals a gj, is a large set in the set that its complement is in this ideal here. And then for any set s, I look at all the sequences of elements of s. So that's just all the functions from natural numbers to S. And I take their equivalence classes. Oh, it's trivial. This is an equivalence relation. Um, OK. And also for any function, say from S1 cross SP to S, I define its extension by tilde to be the function from S1 tilde cross SP tilde to S tilde I just define it in the only obvious way you can. I define f tilde of f1 tilde up to fn tilde, where this is in there and that's in there, just by looking at the function f of f1j, if you like, up to fnj as a function of j and taking that's, um, that gives me a sequence, j maps to f of f1j up to fnj and taking its tilde regarding it as a sequence of elements of S here. Okay. What am I doing for time? All right. Um, then the theorem about this construction is called Wash's theorem, or possibly the fundamental theorem of non-standard analysis, about which I'll make a few comments. Um, this star operator preserves all first order logical structure. Um, such a property, a logical property psi is true of the uh, certain sets S1 tilde up to SM tilde in the, the tilde world, if you like, if and only if it's true of S1j up to SMj for a large set of j. Okay, so it's, um, so let me just give you an example. For example, if L is a field, then L tilde is also a field. Um, so this follows from Wash's theorem because the axioms for a field are first order logical axioms. But you can see that in the, this in a more algebraic way. Um, 
if I just look at all the functions, the sequences from L, the functions from N to L, such that their support is small, okay, the, the points at which they are non-zero is a small set in the above stands, then it's easy to prove that's a non-principal maximal ideal in the usual algebraic sense of the ring N to the L. This is a ring with coordinate wise operations. And this is a maximal ideal in the usual sense. And uh, you factor this ring of sequences from L by this maximal ideal, you get this L tilde defined like above there. Um, so it's a field because it's a ring factored by a maximal ideal. Anyway, one consequence, by the way, we won't really need what first order logic is. Uh, every time we'll use Wash's theorem, you can just verify it directly. But um, um, the point is that if you just look at the usual inclusions of the natural numbers in the integers, in the rationals, in the reals, in the complexes, uh, that holds true when you tilde everything. Uh, further, R tilde is a real closed ordered field. C tilde is its algebraic closure, just like down here. Um, uh, but they're much bigger because, oh, we can embed the lower levels into the upper levels just via constant functions and taking their tilde. So C tilde turns out to be a very large algebraically closed field extending the complex numbers. And in particular, it contains the equivalence classes of all sequences into C. Uh, perhaps a quick word, do I have time, about non-standard analysis. It's usually, or in its infancy, when Robinson, Abraham Robinson invented it, um, it was thought to be, a, or it is, um, a way of rigorously introducing infinitesimals into the calculus. So you, you rigorize Leibniz's um, approach to the calculus. Um, you see this C tilde will contain infinitesimals. It will contain elements less than epsilon for all actual positive real numbers epsilon. Uh, one way to describe an infinitesimal is if it's S tilde, uh, it just meant, amounts to saying that for every ordinary positive epsilon, there's a large set X such that SJ, the jth coordinate of S, is less than epsilon for all J and X. So, um, but it's not quite the same as saying SJ tends to zero on a large set. Um, it's, it's more general than that. Uh, anyway, so then you can, the infinitesimal, and there are even books written developing calculus uh, using this non-standard analysis and this construction, but of course, whether or not you, I mean, it's certainly easier if you, if non-standard analysis comes as second nature, but uh, you probably have to explain that too. So I'm not sure about that, but my view about it is that it gives us structures that you might not have seen before and that can be useful um, when combined with ordinary, completely standard mathematics. Anyway, let's forget that just for a second and uh, get on to the proof of the theorem. Uh, so we have our function, we're back in the standard world now, on this neighborhood of zero. And um, I'm going to, for convenience of the talk, suppose that the derivative of f in the last variable at zero does not vanish. Um, that's not a particularly strong assumption. Um, after a linear change of variables, you can suppose that some derivative in the last variable at zero does not vanish. And then by the Weierstrass preparation theorem, you can actually suppose f is a polynomial, a monic polynomial in the last variable. Um, and that's almost as good as this. Um, uh, so here we can, of course, use the implicit function theorem. So we just take an implicit function phi that um, satisfies this just by the implicit function theorem and this. Oh, and by the way, the phi will have coefficients in K in the number field. That's just by repeated differentiation of this relation here. Um, so, uh, 
In general, this will be an algebraic function of other analytic functions, but that's not too difficult to deal with. Uh, so we'll have this for all sufficiently large j here. Okay. Um, so now we just construct our auxiliary polynomial. Uh, so this is all, as I say, in the standard world, we just take a polynomial, general generic polynomial in Z1 up to Zn of degree d, or rather degree d in each variable. Um, so this is where d is a large natural number. Um, it's large compared with the dimension of the number field K over Q as a Q vector space. And it's also got to be large compared with this number R, which compares the coordinates of the AJs, AIs. And the A alphas are gonna be uh, integers, not all zero. Um, so how do we choose them? Well, we first substitute phi of Z1 up to Zn minus one quite naturally, right? Um, for the last variable, we'll call that function P star of Z1 up to Zn minus one. And now we choose the A alphas um, such that the function P star uh, vanishes to a very high order. So to this order here in each of the variables. And we can do that because, um, so how many, um, how many derivatives do we have to make vanish here? Well, it's this to the power n minus one, and that is d to the, a little less than d to the n, to d to the n, right? Um, d to the n, sorry, d to the n minus one. And that's less than d to the n. And we have that available because there are d to the n um, values we could, uh, a alphas. And the point is you do this just by linear algebra. We have more, equa more unknowns than equations. There's no need to use Siegel's lemma or anything like that. We don't care how big the a alphas are. Um, you, just, uh, you just choose them uh, to make all these uh, this function vanish at zero to this high order. Um, then you just use Schwarz's lemma, which tells us that for small positive t, if we take the complex numbers z1 up to zn minus one, we'll only be interested in real numbers, but we take complex numbers in the disk centered zero radius t, um, then it's modulus because of this order of vanishing here will be less than or equal to a constant. Now the constant will essentially be the sum of the moduli of the A alphas, um, but we don't care how big that is, um, times T to the, well, the degree of vanishing. So that's this number here. So, um, uh, so we can make that as small as that. So in particular, we look in the structure C tilde, in the field C tilde, and look at these elements. These are now elements of the field C, C tilde. And they're obviously less than this T because they're infinitesimal. So we certainly have the modulus of this is less than or equal to the H tilde, which is a bound, remember the bound for the AN tildes to the same exponent, well, negative. And so all these are less than or equal, all these are less than or equal to one over H to tilde. That was right at, at the beginning in our hypotheses. Um, so this is less than or equal to uh, this, just by the Schwarz lemma, uh, essentially. Uh, now, I've written a tilde over the less than or equal to. That's because we're interpreting the ordering on real numbers in R tilde. So this is just what you get when you lift the ordering on the reals up to R tilde. But this thing is a rational number it, well, in the sense of Q tilde. Okay, This is an element of our extension Q tilde. Um, and its denominator, since these are inverse integers, is at most this. OK, 
okay, because um, the coefficients of the p tildes are all uh, integers, um, and um, well, it's a rational number with denominators this, which is less than or equal to h tilde. There are n of them. There's a d here. And they're all bounded by h to the r, each one of these. So their product is bounded by that. But this is much less, well, than the inverse of this, if you take the minus away. So what it means, so since if this is non-zero, its numerator is at least one, that cannot happen because that would conflict with these two inequalities here. So this is the usual auxiliary polynomial argument. Um, so this forces this to be zero. So actually by the Wash theorem, uh, this happens in our non-standard universe, which means that the set of J's for which it happens in the standard universe is large. Okay, that's precisely the Wash theorem. Uh, but this is just the set ZP, right? So uh, ZP is large, but that's our contradiction because we actually constructed our ideal of small sets um, contains all the ZPs. Okay, so ZP is small. So that's the contradiction that proves the key lemma. Let's go back to it. I've got time, yeah. Um, that whenever you have, um, uh, an analytic dependence between inverse integers, between very small inverse integers, that is one over a large integer, then you must have an algebraic dependence as well. Um, now, it's not at all difficult to re redo this proof without mentioning any non-standard notions or ultra filters at all, but it's not so easy to, well, there are a few details here that I omitted, like using the um, Weierstrass preparation theorem, which you use in the extended universe where it becomes very easy and various other little things, but the, it's probably no harder to do this proof without non-standard notions. However, the log lot for the real coefficients, the analytic functions with real coefficients, I, in my view, and my co-authors disagree, I think, but in my view, it's much easier to use the non-standard formulation um, because again, you're proving a finiteness theorem, not, not anything with subtle bounds in it. And uh, there, the induction involves not just going to C tilde, but then you have to do it again and um, do C tilde tilde, and that will eventually get you your, uh, a result like this, even when uh, you have real coefficients. In this case, I have to say, you do need the two Siegel theorem for, for finding integers which make linear forms very small, not real linear forms. You have to use that result, but, um, um, but it's much, I, in my view, easier using this tilde framework. I, I wonder how many people listening will agree, but I'll stop there. Thank you very much.